very warm uh, welcome to today's uh, event, uh, disinformation on migration in V4, how Russia manipulates. Robert Gonchi joins me today from uh, Budapest. Robert is a junior analyst at Migration Research Institute, who actually recently wrote an article on the use of disinformation during the hybrid conflicts on the Polish-Belarusian border. Welcome, Robert. Hello, Liliana. Thanks for having me. Thank you once again for joining us today. Um, all right, so Russia's invasion of Ukraine has begun uh, on 24 February 2022. However, actually the conflict um, on Ukrainian territory has been um, ongoing for a considerable period of time. Uh, however, the attempt of uh, destabilization of the uh, European Union itself also has begun earlier. Um, and here I'm mentioning the crisis on the Belarusian border with three EU and also NATO countries. And here I'm talking about Poland, Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, and this conflict has been ongoing since spring 2021 and was, of course, provoked by the Belarusian uh, authorities. Well, initially, um, they wanted to divert attention from the internal situation also to undermine the international position of uh, their Western neighbors and also to force EU to negotiate sanctions itself. Uh, but um, Robert, maybe we should start with general information. So how it, did the border crisis uh, started and actually what is the genesis of it? Thank you for your question. So um, basically what we can see that there is two uh, main streamlines of this um, conflict that dates back in time and one is uh, inside of Belarus and the other is inside of Russia because uh, due to the union state agreement that uh, Belarus and Russia has there is basically no foreign policy decision making difference between the two countries it's simply not possible because uh, Moscow and Minsk have to um, uh, discuss all those questions that they would like to implement in their foreign policy or their security policy military policy etc even up to the cultural policy actually and um, the, the side of Russia dates back even farther away it dates back to 2014 2015 when Russia started to use the instrumentalization of migration as a tool of hybrid attack against European Union member states and this was a time when um, the uh, Arctic migration route uh, became a thing and um, and Russia started to push migrants through the European Union border to Finland and Norway. Uh, we can maybe remember those pictures of those bicycles around the Arctic cycle where uh, migrants who try to cross the border from or even sometimes successfully cross the border from Russia to the Scandinavian states, like at the very top of these uh, Northern European Union, uh, or not necessarily European Union member states, because we also talk about Norway, but uh, different Western countries. Um, and they left those bicycles behind. And the other, other streamline is inside of Belarus. And this was the time of uh, the uh, Belarusian presidential elections in 2020, when um, the situation started with uh, the destabilization of the Lukashenko regime, which is quite a solid regime inside of Europe. So um, currently, Alexander Lukashenko is the longest serving head of state in Europe, even longer than Vladimir Putin himself. Uh, the, the reign of Alexander Lukashenko dates back to 1994, and uh, there was no interruption like in Russia during the uh, presidency of Dmitry Medvedev. Um, it simply just dates back and goes all along. There is uh, even this uh, old uh, statement from a uh, uh, former uh, um, foreign minister of the US, Condoleezza Rice, that uh, Belarus is the last dictatorship of Europe. Now, about this, um, it's better if we do not start an argument, um, but we can see that currently the state of democracy in Belarus is not in its brightest uh, self, and um, the destabilization of this system created some uh, waves um, that needed 
some drastic, some very unorthodox things to happen in Belarus. And that's the time when Alexander Lukashenko started to grab those tools that he um, inherited from Russia due to the union state agreement, such as the tools for instrumentalization of migration and started to, to pressurize those European Union member states who have a common border with this Eastern European Republic, and these are Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for this uh, brief uh, explanation. Yes, you mentioned that um, what Lukashenko actually did was the weaponization of uh, human beings. But how do we know actually that it was not just Lukashenko, but also Vladimir Putin? Because it seems to be quite obvious that it's not just Lukashenko, but there must be somebody behind. So how do we know that it was a very you know, long process? Uh, of uh, taking the migrants from African countries or maybe Asian countries and just transporting them, I don't know, through, through Russia to Belarus? Like, how do we know that Russia was also involved? Now, um, there are some, um, some experts' reports on how these uh, migration systems work, how these uh, Eastern uh, migratory routes um, events occur and um, what we can see is that basically there were two times two different times when two different methods were used in this front one was the period between 2021 and 2022 and the other was uh, other one was during this year because we can see a shift here during the last year thanks to the uh, the escalation of the war in ukraine and uh, that started also way back in uh, 2014 um just simply shifted the public attention from this uh, migration and border crisis along Belarus to, 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 of course, a war that has been, uh, became more and more widespread in Ukraine. And even the Belarusian regime started to, to focus more on that and not their own artificially created crisis. However, during 2023, when the uh, when the trends of the Ukrainian war just started to um, solidify, they restarted these measures, but with different attributes. And uh, what we can see, what is the difference between these two periods that I have uh, mentioned, is that during the first one, Russia was only involved due to uh, the um, a, the uh, political discussion that has to be happened between Moscow and Minsk, thanks to the Union State Agreement, and Lukashenko um, automatically and uh, and um, on the sovereign method started to use the migratory pressure on the European Union member state without the involvement of Russia, only with the uh, mutual acceptance of Russia that they let Belarus do these things. And why I'm saying that, that they let Belarus do these things, because this is not the first time that Belarus is starting to threaten other countries with something drastic. We remember when uh, they started to close off the uh, Yama line and they did not uh, want the uh, oil to, to enter the territories of Poland and Germany. And during that time, it was exactly Russia who stepped up and told uh, Belarus that this is something that they cannot do. And this is something that gives a huge weapon in the hands of uh, Vladimir Putin and what he can use over Belarus. However, during this year, we can see a shift because thanks to the uh, involvement of the European Union, who uh, swiftly uh, stopped these um, uh, low fare airplanes that flew from the Middle East and North Africa to Minsk and helped those uh, migrants who were lured in with the promise of an easy enter to Europe. Um, they were um, they were banned and they could not enter Belarus the same way they did before. And that's where um, Russia comes into the picture again. And they started to um, relatively remake the situation that Belarus started to do with an extra step because now how the um how the system works how migrants um happens to be at the borders of poland lithuania and latvia is that first they fly to minsk uh, sorry first they fly to moscow and then they are transferred via buses to minsk 
and after that only they are transferred to to the borders and that is a great shift because previously russia was involved but not on a way that they were directly involved with this conflict and now we can see that russia was all along uh, if not the mastermind, but maybe the mastermind of the plan, and they were actively involved in this conflict, because what else could they do? Because um, every decision of Belarus that they are making regarding their military security, foreign policy, as I earlier mentioned, have to go through Moscow, uh, always due to their agreement that they signed in 1999. And tell me, because you mentioned those two phases, uh, right? Uh, the one, let's say, uh, 2021 is the beginning of the war and uh, the current one that is happening this year. Do you see a chance that, will be, that there will be a third phase? And if so, how can it look like? Would there be, you know, some continuation of the threat that they are um, creating actually on the, on the border with the three uh, EU uh, countries? It's really hard to tell because um, there are also different factors that pop up. This is not the only way how to split this conflict into two. There is this other split that we can make that is basically saying that during the first period of time of this conflict, the main uh, important factor for Belarus in this conflict was to pressurize these states, uh, these European Union member states with migrants. Now it's shifted. Um, it's not really important for Belarus anymore to, to, to put these uh, people to the borders. They only do it to spread their disinformation because using that disinformation during this period of time, they are gaining more, uh, more uh, support than with simply just uh, pushing through the migrants because currently the situation looks like that it is more valuable for them, for these uh, for these pure um, poor people who were lured into the, to the woods of Belarus to be stranded there and stay during the winter and freeze to death because then they can create uh, wonderful news to their um, to their different um, state manipulated websites and newspapers and television channels that um, that um, how inhuman the European Union is and how uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia do not uh, stand on EU standards. And this is more valuable currently for them than simply to push people through the border. And because of that, we can see that currently the numbers are higher once again than in 2022. The, uh, the numbers were smaller, the number of migrants at the borders of Belarus and the European Union. However, um, we can also see that um, their numbers are not escalating that high than, for example, in the November of 2021, when we remember the pictures of, uh, of the Polish-Belarusian border at Kuznica, when uh, thousands of people tried to cross the border at the same time. Now we don't see that anymore. We see a relatively small number, which is still relatively high, so we cannot talk about that this conflict has ended, we can only see that they start to react at what is more favorable for them. And currently what is more favorable for them is to create disinformational uh, news which do not pose fake news. Maybe they are just um, illustrating the reality uh, on a different picture that is more favorable for them. And of course, there are lies from them that they are not connected to this anyhow. There is no state control over these events. And these people just simply started to use Belarus as a crossing point to the European Union, which if we think about it, doesn't really make any sense because there is no direct connection between the Middle East and the European Union using Belarus and Russia. So um, we can see with um, relatively non-academic eyes that this is an artificially created crisis at the borders of Belarus, Poland, Lithuania and Latvia. However, of course, the state border committee of Belarus is denying that and saying that this is a randomly occurred uh, happening that they are trying to solve. But what they are saying, what they are suggesting, the European Union is inhuman, do not want to help, and they rather watch these people die in the forest than to, to, to help uh, to get them some help or solution, which is factually not true again, because during 2021, when the conflict or the crisis were at the highest levels, the European Union did not stop thinking about this conflict, and they 
constantly uh, sent um, different high-level politicians from the European Commission to, to negotiate with Belarus or to negotiate with the sender states. They sent Josep Borrell to Iraq and Turkey and the United Arab Emirates, and they tried to find some solution. And eventually they did, and they shut down those um, those airplanes that uh, flew from these states directly to Minsk. But currently, this is the situation that we are at. The focus of Belarus shifted, the involvement of Russia in the crisis shifted, but the conflict is keep going on and we do not see an end of it because it's not favorable for Belarus or Russia to end it. Yeah, and you mentioned that the yeah, EU is uh, um, presented as inhuman etc but you know like there were also some other messages sent from belarusian regime you know showing fake videos uh, of uh, you know fake uh, polish belarusian border showing that people are queuing there to get to belarus because in poland we don't have anything so we're queuing to get to belarus to to receive sugar you know or um, as, there's a problem with because... fake news they yeah. can they can be very <laughs> twisted and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, there are different, you know, um, examples of this kind of ridiculous messages, but unfortunately, people do believe in them. Uh, but yeah, regarding the still the uh, the hybrid threat, um, I believe that it is the duty, and I think everybody or almost majority uh, believes that, that it is the duty of EU member states, but also of NATO, uh, to protect the borders. Uh, however, there are still voices from various circles, um, activists, uh, political uh, parties saying that the border should be open and that migration has only positive um, sides. I uh, recently even um, attended uh, one conference and there was a guy, you know, um, talking that, you know, we should be welcoming everybody even though there are cultural differences, but still uh, we will get a huge advantage out of it. Like he, he, he didn't really uh, see any of the uh, disadvantages of uh, uh, illegal migration. So my, my question would be, is this part of Russian disinformation that people don't see any threat uh, of this uh, weaponization of human beings and just sending, you know, people uh, from African countries, different countries, through Russia, through Belarus, to, to the European Union. Now, um, what we can see, for example, in the uh, network of Russian and Belarusian disinformation is that they are using uh, amazing tools and very complex systems to spread disinformation. In that, we should say that the Russian Federation, and by that Belarus as well, are world class, if not even the top one in using the disinformation as a hybrid tool of, uh, of, uh, of modern warfare. And uh, what they are doing actually is that um, different uh, committees and ministries starting to share uh, half true or non true news at their websites that after that, uh, official fake news sites and outlets such as Belta from uh, from Belarus, or Russia, Yen, um, RT, uh, Sputnik, uh, Ria Novosti is thus from, from Russia starting to reshare uh, on the fact that these are um, official ministries and committees from Belarus who are sharing this information. So it seems legitimate. And after that, even though more and more academic people and experts are uh, starting to point it out that those articles are not true, they are unlinking deep fake videos uh, such as the ones you mentioned to these articles that after uh, sharing, they start to reshare using the social media and they start to circulate these videos and pictures using Telegram and from Telegram using Facebook and Instagram and other uh, media, uh, social media sites that uh, makes it impossible to put down those fake news and more and more people starting to feel like that those news which went through um, 30 different layers are becoming more real and real and eventually some uh, western european non-fake news outlets will uh, find it um, um, legitimate and they will reshare it and that's where the fake news propaganda is really uh, pointing out and that's where this information starts to work and for example there were two very interesting examples in this in this uh, in this crisis once when um, 
Poland, Lithuania and Latvia decided to close down the borders as strictly as possible using different physical border barriers. This was during the time when there were no fences at these borders or not finished fences. Because, for example, between Lit Lithuania, Latvia and Belarus, for, for most of the time in the past hundred years, there were no border at all. So there... Uh, they had to start building physical border barriers from zero. It was a better situation with Poland and Belarus because uh, originally this was the border between the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union. So already there were some physical border barriers, but between Lithuania, Latvia and Belarus, there were nothing at all. And during that time was when Belarus and, and Russia started to share the disinformation of the inhumanity of, of those um, border guards. And after that, when the fence is finished, um, I still remember an article from National Geography that uh, they shared that building these fences are hurting the uh, uh, natural habitat of animals at the region. And now that was a fantastic example how a fake news can reach even such a very respected newspaper as the National Geographic, that they reshare uh, a simple Russian propaganda that uh, they try to, to use to, again, depict these countries as inhuman, as not caring and uh, very vile, which is, which is of course not true. Now, this is the same situation with, uh, with the uh, topic of illegal migration. Using the Russian and Belarusian narratives, these people are poor refugees who are arriving to these borders where they are harshly rejected by these European Union member states and they are not letting in those people. But if we look at those people who are stranded at the border, even though that we have to say, and I will say that again, that they are indeed um, misled people who are in a very terrible situation and we need to find some solution to how they can go back home because they have some visas that they do not let them enter the territory of the European Union, but also those visas do not let them re-enter Belarus. So they are stranded at, those, uh, at that line between these European Union member states and Belarus. So... Um, for that, there were some solutions like the repatriation flights that uh, failed to work because new people came. But what we can say about these migrants who are stranded at the border is that they are not from the um, worst uh, life situation that they are coming from. They are somewhere from the, from the middle class of these countries because they could buy the facilitated visa and they could buy those... Um, uh, those airplane tickets. In that, nobody helped them. So they uh, honestly had some money to reach the border between Belarus and the European Union member states. And sometimes they are from very strange countries. We had a discussion with the Latvian border guards last October, and they mentioned that more and more Cuban uh, migrants starting to appear at the Belarusian-Latvian border, uh, simply because they were the ones who could easily get uh, 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 Moscow or, or uh, Russia has very different types of visas and one is the Moscow visa which is a little more uh, flexible than other Russian visas that you would like to get and they could easily access um, Moscow visa and they could easily access Belarusian visa so uh, they have started to use this as a way to reach Spain actually as a target country so this is a very complex situation that we see here and um, and we do not really know that um, how this uh, conflict is going to play out. But one thing that we can say for sure is that this information is used in this situation very effectively. And Russia and, of course, by that Belarus as well, is world class in using disinformation tools in their hybrid warfare. This is, of course, not the first time that they are using it. They are using it during the Ukraine conflict. They are using it during the South Caucasian conflicts. They have been using that in previous years in Belarus as well. And of course, these news are not all for uh, confusing Westerners. This is also for confusing their own population. Because as I previously mentioned, um, during uh, 2020 uh, and 2021, when the uh, crisis started at these borders, the um, popularity of Lukashenko in Belarus was an all-time low, even though, of course, polling numbers did not show that. But um, after the election where um, uh, Lukashenko 
supposed to lose, but he did not lose, but he beat uh, on paper um, his um, his main opponent, Svetlana Tsianouskaya, uh, who should have won um, due to the polls. Um, it started to generate uh, a public um, opinion on that, even though we should also say that there is a very solid social security system in Belarus. There is a very high level IT sector in Belarus. And these all are a part of the Belarusian regime's wonder that they can maintain their power. I mean, Lukashenko and his people uh, by maintaining this system. And when this system starts to scramble, for example, with, uh, with 2020, 2021, um, they starting to use more unorthodox methods to start showing the people how in their eyes uh, Western Europe is really look like uh, to show the population that they are inhuman, that they do not care about people and uh, start to pull back the people from the uh, from the loving hands of, of, of the European Union and start to show them that we are the more protective and we are the more peaceful solution to your life problems. So um, this is again a two streamline um, um, event that we see here. One of the disinformation methods is for Western Europe, which includes the V4 countries from a Belarusian perspective as well. And the other one, uh, is for is for uh, the local population. Thank you, Robert. Uh, in Poland, we also experienced some, uh, let's say, uh, well, we, we had some fans of not uh, building uh, the fence at the border. However, most of their uh, opinions changed when uh, Finland also announced that Finland will also build a fence. So then there was no argument um, against it. Uh, so my very last question uh, to you would be whether there are some um, possibilities uh, to prevent this kind of crisis in the future. Is it even possible as for the European Union, how to you know, fight with it? It was very great to see that um, actually the reaction of these three countries were by the book. So first of all, uh, these countries announced a state of emergency with a very strict exclusion zone where only the military could move and they can only protect the border because at the beginning of this crisis we did not know that only migrants are arriving but also uh, maybe belarusian soldiers arriving in the skies so it was a very um, very gray zone action that uh, belarus started to do that so the only legitimate reaction for that was to to build up this exclusion zone and, and keep civilians out from it and keep the media out from it and keep NGOs out from it. Because again, those are uh, different uh, entities that can create uh, in an active war zone. Because if we look at this hybrid attack as an active uh, uh, act of crime um, of war, be, be, which is basically it is, because that's the, that's the system how hybrid attacks work that they are basically attacks against another country without the conventional use of force. Uh, in that period of time, this was the perfect decision that the country could have made. And then to start and build the physical border barriers, that was another thing that once again um, showed that um, Poland, Lithuania and Latvia learned from other European Union countries' decisions and, um, and they would like to solve this situation as soon as possible and they did not hesitate and they did not care about the voices coming from different uh, European institutions. At the beginning, I remember the European Commission was not that supportive um, towards these countries as they later started to be towards Lithuania and Latvia uh, especially. Um, which Poland, it's another situation, but that has uh, another reason, uh, of course. But um, what we see that these reactions were perfect to deal with the situation. And by that, these countries could minimize the risk of how um, escalation, how escalation would work in this conflict. And now we can see that uh, there is no chance anymore for an active military attack, for example, or there is a very minimal chance for that. It's more about the uh, debate 
on how humanitarian is this situation actually is and what can we do with those people who are misled and rightfully cannot enter these countries, the European Union member countries involved in this conflict and how can we deal with Belarus and their, um, and their disinformation attacks. Thank you very much, Robert. It was a very interesting conversation. I learned a lot and I believe that our viewers also learned a lot. Uh, the event will be available on our Facebook, YouTube channel um, and at our webpage. Uh, so to be sure to, to share today's event with those who might be interested. Thank you so much once again for joining us again and well, see you next time. Thank you for having me.